You are listening to Missed Apex iRacing Podcast. Let's get faster. Welcome to Missed Apex iRacing Podcast. Our task here to make you faster, and by you I mean me. If people accidentally get faster listening to this, I suppose that's fine. But generally, I get experts on like Brad Philpot. Hey, Brad. Good evening, Spanners. How are you? I'm good. I have been listening to your sage words of advice. Okayama, I said I was getting closer to the top guys in our group. Silverstone, I think I took another step forward. And it's just amazing how, with enough pace to not be going backwards through the races, I am just having such a better racing experience. And I sent you a video of what I think is my most fighty, aggressive race so far. Yeah, and it's nice to see you actively trying to move forward uh, and being assertive, even if I have some criticism of some of your racecraft. Okay, so I'm looking through the notes where you've done red for bad thing and a green tick for good thing. You've you've sent me one, two, three, four, five, six, eight bad things and one green tick. No, I, I think it's a bit more balanced than that, but I genuinely wanted to make sure you knew what the good things were because I think that's a quite a yeah. good style of, of coaching is to reinforce the positives, even if there are only a few. Yeah, we, we call it a poop sandwich, don't you? So you do good thing, all the bad things in the middle, and then good thing at the end. But they are genuine, though. Um, there are a couple of times where you were very assertive in an overtaking move. You didn't go for a mm. half move, and that made it safer for everyone. So it's like being a footballer, and so far on this podcast, what we've worked on is just passing drills, uh, building up our strength and stamina, but we've not actually been talking much about the match until the last couple of episodes. So now I'm finding myself trying to be more aggressive with a bit of pace racing, and I realize I've opened up a whole new world of things I'm terrible at and don't know what to do in. The good thing is though, as you'll see from some of the notes I've made on your video, they're quite simple things to fix. Things like just don't pull out of the slipstream until you're nearly at the corner. You know, don't just have a face full of fresh air for no reason until you need to. That's really easy to fix. Once you know that, you'll just now hopefully implement it. Excellent. So what we've done here is I've sent you a video. I've uploaded that video on YouTube uh, and we'll have the link in the show notes below. So if you want to follow along, Brad will give the timestamps for the things he's talking about and you can just flick to that and look at the visual of what I did as well as Brad's description. But don't worry if you don't, we'll try and describe it as well. That's probably topic three today, but we're also joined, thank goodness he's come back, by YouTube sensation, Scott Tuffy, aka Stuffy. How's it going, Stuffy? I'm very well, thank you, Spanners. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. I was really honoured to be in this the second split with you on um, the 10 o'clock Silverstone F3 official. I felt like I was in the celebrity split. <laughs> it was good good to see you and nice to, I was nice surprised when I got a, a hello from you I was like oh there he is yeah, it's nice because it, the community is quite big in F3 but you do start to see the same names again and again and I think just about everyone in F3 knows that Scott Tuffy is going to stream their race and I wonder if it affects <laughs> behaviour uh, well I, I like to think, I think so as I said in the last podcast I did notice uh a few differences uh, from when I first started F3 and the way people kind of race me. Uh, but I have seen a lot of new faces as well uh, where things haven't quite gone so well. Um, and that obviously the name hasn't got got there yet. But um, it yeah, it's obviously I'm really enjoying F3 recently. And uh, I sent you some links because I've, instead of getting angry when people wipe me out, because at Okayama I was taken out in five of seven races, I think. So instead of getting mad, I've started doing span as f3 magical adventures where i just post a clip of what went wrong and and what i think caused it because in the two clips i've done so far it was seven cars taken out per incident yes yeah i've had a look at both of those and yeah obviously f3 well known for um carnage and crashes unfortunately and i've done a couple of videos as well before in trying to improve just the general race craft of yeah of, of the community to try and get us all to have closer and cleaner racing. Well, like you, I'm hoping people will see Richard Reddy in, in their race and go, oh, <laughs> I, best, I best not stuff it in this race. I'll end up on one of his videos. And that's the aim. Yeah, exactly. And that's, it's, you're doing the right thing as well. It's, it's so easy to, to get heated and kind of say something we regret um, in the moment because, of course, mm. we're annoyed we've, we've crashed out. But 
the important thing is is to learn from it and see is there anything that I could have done better because we're not always completely free of fault. How dare you? Yes, I am. No, no, no. <laughs> you're, you're absolutely right. And I, I'm quite harsh on myself, actually, now. I go, OK, what could I have done to avoid that? Even if that guy's an idiot, it's the zebra crossing thing, isn't it? Yes, the guy who hit me might have been wrong, but could I have waited longer at the zebra crossing? Uh, we're also joined by Matt Two rumpets. Hi, Matt. How are you? You didn't seem too happy after our swarm night last night. Well, uh, you know how you, you, you mentioned the fact that you did seven races this week, and how many have you yeah. done this week? Oh, this week. Oh, so the last two weeks, yes, I've had a bit of chill time. Thank, I think I've earned it. But yes, I got seven races in last week, and I think I got seven in this week as well, which is brilliant. Definitely the way to do it, and much easier than just doing a couple of races a week. Yeah, well, I normally do either one or two races a week just because I, I find the fixed nature of having to be unavailable for that period of time to be a challenge. Um, and of the last four races I've done, I've been crashed into in all four of them. And in only one of them have I actually managed to gain I rating. And that was a staggering four that I managed to gain. So it's, it's been a torrid been a, been a torrid uh, little era here for me after the first three races where I had no crashes at all. On the bright side, this is the first time in a long time that I've got a higher I rating than you. So if you want to look at an upside, there it is. Yeah, well, um, yeah, there indeed it is. Thankfully, Two I'm doing okay in some of my league competitions <laughs> to salve my wounded ego. 2,150. That's the highest I rating I've had for a long time. I'm delighted because when we went from Formula Renault 2.0, Brad, to F3, Every single person in our swarm just took a massive dive down and you just sidestepped that. Like You were never going to consider coming and doing regular F3 with us because it's just too I-rating damaging. Yeah, one of the really big considerations when choosing a series for me is how likely I am to just get randomly taken out by the action in general. So yeah, I, I've been trying my hardest to not lose I-rating, but I am on the lowest I-rating I've had in about oh, six no. months. Poor thing. What are you on? So I'm down to 6,440. <gasps> Pathetic. That's having lost a few hundred this week purely to technical issues. Oh. Um, internet going down at the start of a race, uh, VR crashing and not allowing me back into the session and just get coming last for no reason. So nice. it's annoying. Yeah, 6,000 still, it's okay. It's quite high. But for you, of course, losing one race's worth of I rating is about six good races worth, isn't it? Yeah, and maybe more. Uh, mm. So it normally, I normally gain about 16. If I win the top split, I get about 16 I rating. So uh, depending, obviously, how, how right. highly rated the and race is. And if you lose, so, you lose a couple of hundred. Yeah, exactly. Oh, and right. That's, that's yeah. happened a couple of times. Yeah, I'm still at the, the stage where if I do, if I, if I crash out of two and do well in two, I'm generally still up. Um, Scott, what is your I rating? Because why did we end up in the same stream? I, my presumption, in the same split, my presumption with you doing YouTube stuff and committing to F3 is you take quite a hit from A, doing all the production and B, oh, focusing on F3. Yeah, I think I said it on, on the last time I was on the podcast. I, unlike Bradley, I really enjoy F3. <laughs> um, and Yes, unfortunately, been taken out a number of times and of my own fault as well. Uh, F3, unless you're super quick, it's, it's one of the most difficult series to gain I rating. But the reason I've we, we were in the same split was because mainly because you've made good progression. You're up into 2.1K now, which is good. Yeah. And I've made some good progression as well. I'm up to 2.5K now. And uh, and Silverstone this week, which F3 is at, is a very popular track. Yes. So um, there's very high participants and yeah, it put us together, which was nice. Yeah, there's something with the uh, F3 though. Yes, it's disastrous. Uh, yes, it's crashy. But there's something about it. It's like a, it's my white whale. I just I want to beat it before we move on. Um, but one of the reasons me and Matt haven't been able to beat it is related to what we were talking about last week. Brad, you were taking us through the super secret double clutch starts. Yeah. Yes. And you use no, no. those successfully every race. Yes, to to a greater or lesser extent. Normally, I have it absolutely nailed and make sure that I've I've got all the settings completely down to a T before I'll even commit to a race. But in the new series, I've just started entering Formula 3.5 
and it's got a slightly different start procedure to some of the other series or, or yeah. different methods that seem to have positives and negatives. So, uh, but most of the time I get it right. All right, we'll talk 3.5 in a second, but both me and Matt, one of them is in my fail videos linked in the show notes below. Um, Matt also got wiped out. You didn't, you made, how many grid spots did you make before you got crashed out, Matt? Maybe five? Yeah, it had to, <laughs> it had to be less than 10 because I started 10th. Let's talk about the community then, Stuffy, because it's a nightmare. There's so many people trying this weird clutch start, and I think it's down to the wheel you have that's encouraging all of this. Oh, don't don't try and blame me. <laughs> um, well, you're an influencer. No, it, <laughs> no, it is um, it is one of my biggest pet peeves about the series. Um, of course, iRacing is a sim, and we obviously the the purist in us wants it to be as realistic as possible. But I think sometimes, for the sake of enjoyment and for other people's enjoyment, um, there's certain aspects we need to rein in a little bit, um, and the. The manual clutch start is one of those. I see so many people just completely mess it up and they just spin the wheels and they take out half the field um, before they even get to the first corner. And I just, yes, there is a massive benefit to it. If you can nail it and spend as much practice as Brad was saying, um, perfecting it. I see people launch off the line and they pick up plenty of spots, but how many people genuinely have that time to practice most of us in the f3 community or on i racing do it as a hobby we're not full-time sim racers who put the practice in most people just jump in but and i'm auto clutch all the way even though i've got a wheel with two clutches i just safe and steady off the start i'll play the long game <laughs> yeah well I, and i want to ask you about this because this has been something that has come up in other series and discussions the, the guy that took me out and the guy behind me that crashed into the both of us spun the wheels up off the start, went to the left. I was starting on, I was an even grid spot, so I was on the inside. Stepped on the gas again once he got control of it, and then the car spun up the wheels the other direction. And so iRacing does this thing. It's like food, you know? If you drop it on the floor, there's like the five-second rule. But like with iRacing, and if you spin the tires... It's like the three second rule, even though the car feels like it's come back to you. If you step on the gas again, it's just going to, you're going to immediately lose it. And, and it's a yeah. really frustrating thing about the model for me. Have you noticed that? It's the same if, if you like just go wild in a corner as well and like go four wheel drift. Suddenly you find for like three corners, the car is just undrivable. Yeah. Um, I mean, the tire model has been a, a big discussion for God knows how long. Um, I'm Brad's probably better, a much, much better suited to talk about it than I am. Uh, but yeah, in particular with obviously the spinning, uh, they have tweaked the model a few times um, and it has got better. I mean, like a couple of seasons ago, you'd start the F3 series um, or race with cold tyres entirely. And that was just causing so many crashes before the first corner or the first couple of corners. So they've added obviously tyre temperatures um, at the start of a race, which did sort it out a little bit and help matters. But yeah, overall, it's um, it's open for discussion. So I actually have a question for you, Stuffy. Do you know if you join the grid as soon as it allows you to, so say with two minutes remaining until the, the lights go out, if people take their time to join, does your tyre temperature drop in that period? Or does it kind of stay held at uh, whatever you joined at until the lights come on? Because I don't know. I've never, that's a good point, actually. I've never actually um, had a check to see if that's the case. I would like, I would assume so, um, because I've noticed with fuel, obviously, if you join, uh, we, if you join, obviously, no. as soon as the tra uh, grid allows you to, your fuel only ever so slightly. But if you have, um, obviously, a wheel that shows your fuel counter, um, it will trickle down. So, no way. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, we need to test this immediately, Brad. This is this could be huge. Well, I don't know how you can test the the live tire temperature. Um, maybe do some of the cars have a live temperature gauge, or maybe the LMP two or LMP one, maybe. But yeah. I've got a feeling that when you join, the moment you're on the grid, your tires are just ebbing temperature away, which is why I've definitely seen some pros wait, and I I never I never knew whether they were doing it just because they thought maybe it had an effect or whether they knew 
if you wait till the last moment to join, your tyres are at a hotter starting temperature? LMP2 is definitely can see it on the dash of the wheel. So there, yeah, I'm I'm going to go test that after this. That's a good point. And I'll, uh, I'll report, back to, report back to you guys. The downside of this is I tend to join straight away because I don't want to be Jack, like, you know, from like the old like Halo 3 multiplayer lobby. And they're like, ready up, ready up, Brad. So I just get straight on the grid. And I tend to join reasonably soon because I want to make sure that I've got time to fix stuff if it goes wrong. Yeah. Because obviously that's the exact point where the VR headset will just not have any sound for no reason. And I'll have yeah. to unplug it all quickly and plug it back in. Or, or you know, I want to get my uh, all my boxes set up in yeah. the right screen and, and just check everything's working, run through the start process in my head, that kind of thing. So that's yeah. why I don't wait. That's the time to pessimistically prepare for your your pit stop after you crash isn't it don't change my tires please uh don't put any more fuel in so yeah you need that time um yeah all right okay we need to find that out so get on that but in the meantime perhaps we can answer this question from mattel kim who is one of our patrons in our patron slack group he asks very related how do you warm up the tires for qualifying currently i use brake all the way around the outlap and accelerate at the same time to get heat in the brakes don't do that at your local cart track. You will get a very sarcastic board that says pedals because you're not allowed to do that. But why can't you do that in a go-kart, Brad? What damage does it do if you use both? Well, if it doesn't have the simple mechanism which physically prevents you from pressing both pedals at the same time, which the majority of rental carts do oh, have, right. um, what it would do if it allowed you, so if you're doing it in a, in a race cart, for example, is you, you're just wearing out the clutch and the brakes <laughs> okay. because... First of all, the brakes don't need to get up to temperature um, in a rental car. And secondly, if you're holding the car on the brakes and you've got a, uh, you know, a clutch because it's, uh, it's, it's not a direct um, driven mm. rear axle, it, you'll just be slipping the clutch and getting it really hot. And oh, just, see, just for no reason. Car. Okay, fair but enough. Yeah, so don't do that. Don't so do that. I, I've been sitting here trying because, okay, so here's the tips we got from, from Dory. He said, put your tire pressures up in qualifying to get them to heat up. Put your wing front and back up two clicks so you've got more pressure on the tyres to warm them up more. I uh, can't remember the other one he said. Uh, obviously, take fuel out as well um, and hold the brakes. So I've been trying all of those. I have found the adding of the wing is a nightmare because you just the car behaves completely differently, so I've stopped doing that. I'm unconvinced that doing the tyre pressures makes any difference. And I've tried holding the brakes, and again, I can't see any difference. So let's have Matt... Brad, then Scott. I'm sure we've all got something to say on this. Matt, what's your approach? Well, actually, it's it's interesting that you ask this because after watching the same video that you sent to Brad, one of the things I noticed was that you, like me, in the opening stages of the race, like I don't even bother trying to race too much until lap three because no. it, it takes me that long to get the grip that I'm used to on my long runs. So I thought to myself, what can I do differently? The first thing I did was that I stepped on the accelerator in the pits in neutral, and then I put it into first gear and lit up the rear tires on the way out. And then the second thing I did was when I went into each corner, I tried to turn in early going too fast and slide the front wheels, like, like purposely understeer through the opening parts of the lap to try and get more temperature into them. And I, I, was, I felt like I was able to get quicker lap time sooner, but I don't really know if that was just because yeah. I convinced myself that was working. I, I think there's a lot of that, Brad, isn't there? There's a lot of kind of, what do you call it, when you convince yourself of a thing? Confirmation bias. I did the thing, I went faster, therefore it's better, or if you didn't improve in lap time, it's because you did it wrong or something. I, I haven't found any of those methods have helped me, and I'm specifically talking about qualifying here. So that outlap you have is what do you do on the outlap? Yeah, so I, I assume you're also specifically talking about the Formula 3 cars because some yes. of the other cars yeah, yeah. do not require any tyre warm-up at all. Well, in, in fact, fact, I remember with the MX-5, we used to crawl around the opening lap because you didn't want to heat them up at all. Yeah, and in the F1s that I've been doing most recently, similar kind of thing. You, you actually actively try not to push very hard on the outlap because you want the tyres to not overheat during the, the actual qualifying laps. But anyway, talking about a car where you do yes. have cold tyres and you need some extra temperature... Um, I'll be completely honest. I think you generally will lose more time by not just getting used to the car in its current state. 
Um, I think you'll lose more time through that than you will through slightly colder tires. The technique I have is just drive as fast as I possibly can, as if it's the qualifying lap, get used to how the car responds so that when I start the next lap, I'm just up to speed with the car and I'll just be quicker um, because of that. So that's my technique. Yeah, I'm pretty... I like to think uh, I'm I'm the same as the professional there, <laughs> um, but I, I don't do any weaving, really. Um, when I, first, I tried to do that when I first started, but I'd just spin the car. So I'd do a mixture of Brad, uh, what Brad does, and Matt. I'll um, try and force some more understeer to warm the tyres up slightly through the corners. But yeah, generally speaking, I'll just try and go as fast as possible. And I'll, I know that that first lap is not going to be quick. Um, so I almost use the first lap as, as another a warm-up lap. lap. Yeah. Yeah. And then the second lap is where I really go for it. And yeah. hopefully, uh, yeah. The first qualifying in. lap in F3 is just about making sure you don't start last, isn't it? So like, if you can get a time up there and go, it says 10, you're like... Okay, well, worst comes to the worst, I'm 10th. Yeah, it's just about getting that banker in and, and making sure that you don't rip the car as well so that you can um, actually mm. have enough time to put in um, a second lap. Okay, but Brad, what if weaving, say, down the Wellington Strait makes me feel like a pro because I've seen it on telly? Surely that adds a little bit of time. So I've actually heard from pros in, in when I've had the privilege of being in some really good sim teams with people who know a lot more about it than I do and they've told me that weaving makes literally no difference like you you are not generating the temperature you think you are <laughs> obviously in real life if you do it correctly there is definitely some increase in surface temperature and sidewall temp um, temperature all that kind of thing but apparently in iRacing it's just not really a thing and you're just wasting your time so you'll gain way more from using the brakes if you really want some extra temperature, you know, dragging the brakes on the straight, that kind of thing. Okay, guys, we're going to move on now. I think towards the, the end of the show, before we close out, I want to hear about uh, Brad's change of series because I am also looking for... I'm looking for another series, Scott, where I can not farm my rating, but a series that I can jump into a bit more casually and that if I think, oh, okay, I'm not going to get just wiped out today. Therefore, I can just finish... Do you know what I mean? Something a little bit more stressful and less kind of I rating damaging. So, but you you are steadfastly at the F three, or are you looking around for other series to just do casually as well? Um, I generally mix between F three and I love the LMP two car. Um, right. And I racing did recently just announce um, some new series that are coming in the next season. Oh, okay, um, okay, yes, including yeah, um, a, a derivative of the F three series as well. So I think we'll end the show on that. So. But let's get to the this video. You've all seen have you all seen my my video that I posted? Or I sent you the yes. replay file. So this is the F3 race that I did at uh two o'clock. And it is the it's the raciest I've ever been. I know because I know I mentioned this a lot, Brad, but you have told me you, that one time it rings around in my head that says, Spanners, you have no raced craft whatsoever. And I remember the joyful glee on your face to have spotted someone with so little racecraft. And it has been my mission since then, four years ago, to build up to this point where I can show you a video that I didn't just, like, normally what I do is I do dad driving. As soon as someone's being a bit rough, I go, ooh, best let them get on their way, kind of thing. Today, I tried to get on it. So there's a link in the, uh, the notes below. There's a YouTube video. You can follow it along while you're watching if you have the opportunity to do so. Stick it on mute and jump to the timestamp that Brad mentions. If not, we'll try and give you a little bit of a description of what happened. Um, right, Brad, do, do you want to go to the the first one? I, I just pick out the ones. Don't, don't feel like you have to be too complimentary. If it was too good, I don't want to be embarrassed by like gushing praise. So feel free to just focus on some of the more negative things just for the sake of the show. Right. So I think I've probably made 10 to 15 individual oh. timestamp notes. Oh, God. And it's about 50 50, the good ones and the bad <laughs> okay, ones. But the, cool. first, the first four are bad. Okay. So hang on. Well, in that case, I'll tell you what, let's do it this way. If we could lump the good ones into kind of one general, what's the kind of things I'm doing right? And then we'll focus on the bad things for the timestamps. How's that? Okay. So in general, Oh, it's not really a general oh, thing. Isn't it? Okay. Occasionally you'll do a thing. No, so <laughs> okay, fair enough. You, in so that you, case, you stick to your plan then. 
you I'll tell you some good things. You squeezed the attacking car that was trying to pass you quite well. Timestamp. Time so, time um, three minutes, 20 into the video is an example of that. Okay. So you're defending into cops and someone's attacking you on the outside and you squeeze them to the edge. So you give yourself the best possible entry line and you give them the least room possible to try and get past you. So that was good. Um, and you also, you also kind of did the opposite of that later at five minutes, 30 into the video after having left the door open and letting someone through, um, you did then leave space at the apex for them to exist. So you didn't let them through and then close the door on well, them. Well, we so, discussed this last week. So if you think there's a move coming, you don't have to wall of death around the outside. You just need to leave them enough room for the move to either happen or not happen. And if they understeer into you, that's their fault. And I've, I've tried to take that on board and gone, well, do you know what? If they do understeer into me, that's their fault. I just can't live in fear of that the whole time. Matt? Yet you blamed me in our WhatsApp chat when I did that exact no, thing. No, no, that's completely different. I can get into I can get into I can get into that. I can get into that because what you did was you stayed steadfastly on the racing line as somebody came down the inside of you. And they went to shut the door on the exit and you stayed on the racing line. I beg your pardon. That was into the steep turn three. They came around me. I left them the inside. I continued on my path around the outside, and they just drove straight to the edge of the track, right through my right front wheel send me that video and we will link matt's incident there as well so you can do a whose fault is it with that too uh brad um, well, i'm going to give you just a couple more good things before we get on to the the areas of improvement okay okay? okay okay so twice i made a note that you made a good decisive overtake so you didn't didn't dally around you just made it happen and it made it safe that was at seven minutes 29 and at 16 minutes and nine seconds so both Thank of those you. were good overtakes so well done <laughs> And the last good thing that I'll mention is you didn't defend fresh air at seven minutes, 53, when someone was kind of hovering behind you, Okay, you, you didn't just defend when they weren't going to come through. And I, I, I noticed that even though it's, you're doing nothing, you're just staying on the mm. racing line. I was expecting you to have a bit of a, a wobble across to half defend and you didn't do that. And that helped you keep that position. Yes, I think I have had the tendency to, to do that, to defend the non-move or, or to allow a, a move to happen that that guy had no intention of of happening and it was actually causing problems because someone would get in a kind of half threatening position and I'd go okay on you go and they weren't expecting it so we'd be both after you after you and just cause you know and, and it would cause more chaos but what I'm finding recently is that I'm finding myself in the pack battles and Scott in those F3 battles between like you know from first to seventh or whatever People are really tight. It's really competitive, especially in those first few laps. And it feels like everyone's just trying to kill each other. It's a nightmare. Yeah, it's obviously can sometimes end up very badly. And sometimes you can have great wheel to wheel racing, which is what we all want um, from the sim and from that series, which is why I race it. I absolutely love it in <laughs> VR. Uh, but it's the one thing that I've particularly learned is patience especially in the first couple of laps i know i've got genuine pace over people and because i've got the uh, i'm fortunate enough to have vr i'm i've got that spatial awareness whereas i've come to understand that not everyone has that because they've might have single monitors or just genuinely not look around them yeah and that's why i'm a bit picky sometimes of I'm taking my time more in lining up a move and making sure um, I get a good run on them rather than just because I, I want to finish yeah. a race. Do, do you consider that at all, Brad? Because I've got the feeling that you just drive as if everybody is in VR and everyone you, you, you are driving in as close to a real world environment as you can in sim racing. And, and I'm guilty of not doing what Scott said. And I'm guilty of just assuming everyone's got that field of view. So it's a little bit different for me in general because I'm fortunate to, I'll always be in the top split and I'm generally racing the people at the front of the top split and you you can push them a little bit harder in terms of what you can get away with, how, how much awareness they have. Whenever I'm coming up to traffic, I leave them massive amounts of room. If it's, say, like earlier on today, I raced in a, a 2.5K split one and that basically meant that um, I had to be, had to be very careful lapping traffic because the people at the back had quite low eye ratings um, and I shouldn't have been able to lap them. It's quite a long track. I'm at Monza. So 
I was just very, very careful. So I'm kind of a mix. If it's a very high race and I'm racing really good people, like my friend Ramon the other day, who's a multiple Formula 2 race winner in real life, <laughs> yeah. we can drive right to the edge and you know no one's ever going to make contact. So it, it's situational. Okay, so I've done what I should have done before the show, which is send these guys the YouTube video so they can stick those on mute and, and have a look at the timestamp as we talk about it. So what's the next uh, discussion point, Brad? Okay, so I'm just going to start at the very beginning uh, and I won't go through every single point, but... Basically, on it's kind of quite a good segue from what you were just talking about. You drove way too far around the outside at turn two for no reason. <laughs> so at Silverstone, turn two is a big flat out left-hander. Uh, and you basically were so cautious of the other yes. cars. I think you let two or three cars pass you for literally no reason. So you don't need to be quite that nice to everyone at the start. Okay, so uh, 11 seconds, 16 seconds, and 23 seconds are very similar. So you've said drives too far around the outside for no reason, stays too close to the inside of the corner, much tighter than needed. That's turn three, the very tight right-hander into towards village. And then I think this is round turn four, drives too far around the outside. You've put again for no reason. But uh, Scott, I think this is this is what you were talking about, which is why it's just like an abundance of caution, just going, please don't hit me in this first bit. Yeah, and Brad is obviously exactly totally right there. Um, you did go a little bit too far wide, but I totally get your reasonings for it as well in your thought process because there is just, I've seen that a couple of times this week where um, people on cold tyres as well, they've put too much steering input and they've spun it round uh, the second corner. And so it's, I, I get your thought process, but at the same time, it depends on the, on the situation. And at the start, especially in these cars of how fragile they are, yeah, we just want to survive those first few laps where, yeah, unfortunately, not all of us are racing in the top split. So we, can't, we don't quite know what people are going gonna to do. So from my point of view, the reason that that's a little bit um, dangerous by doing that is you've effectively given yourself more cars to overtake now. And, yes. and if they were starting behind you, they're probably not as good as you again. So you've given yourself extra work to do. I have, when, yeah. when you just, you still could be cautious without being quite that cautious. All right, so, tell me what to do instead. So just look, you've got VR, look and see where they are and okay. just leave them some room. <laughs> yeah, you don't yeah. have to kind of assume they're there if they're not there. If I'm racing at the start, I'm yeah. looking to the side. You've got this unrealistic <laughs> advantage that you don't have in a real car with a hands device on, yeah. where you can just look left or look right and see exactly where the other cars are and leave them a net codes width, but maybe not a full track width. Fair enough. We, we all drive VR here. Scott, w the problem I'm having in VR is... I'm looking at the corner. So if I'm doing wall of death around the outside of turn four, I don't want to put a tire on the wheel and spin out. I'm too scared to like look over to my left hand side, take a good look because then I think I'm just going to drive off. Yeah, I've, I've got better at that. And it's just, you just need a quick glance and then you know where they are and maybe turn your headset up as well. Um, because if you've got a good, decent enough headset, you'll have the surround sound and know how oh. close they are to you. So maybe plan around with your sound settings. Oh, maybe. And that'll help with your spatial awareness too. Oh, I'm even more spoiled because I use the podcast audio. So I've got go. the audio coming in from a mixing desk into like these headphones that I'm wearing for the podcast. I put that over the top of the VR. But Matt, it's, it's not just me. I'm, I know we've got the VR, but I, I'm petrified to look left and right. I'm like focused. Yeah, I, I'm I'm exactly the same way. You get to a once you get into your braking zone and you spot the line you want to take around the apex, whether you're dead on it or you're trying to leave a car's width. I don't really want to take my eyes off it till I'm headed towards the exit. So all I was just going to um, slot in here is that you might actually be putting yourself at a disadvantage by using your fancy podcasting. Um, sound. I don't know whether your your VR would support this anyway, but certainly mine is 3D sound. So as I turn oh. my head, where the sound is changes. What? So if, I, so if I turn left, then it's not like I get the exact same audio. No. Where the other cars are stay in the correct I didn't know that. physical position. So if you plug into your headset, if it's a good enough headset, it probably has 3D sound anyway. Um, mine definitely does. Scott. I can't remember off the top of my head, but I think there's a setting on iRacing that you click that is um, in the audio settings, turn with movement, I think it is. No, all this um, time. So, And that's for VR. So yeah, as Brad's saying with 3D movement, it's, oh, if you no. turn your heads, obviously it 
Yeah, it compensates for it. Obviously it okay, louder. so the solution is clearly get my, my studio headphones and just plug it into my Oculus Rift. Oh, all yeah. this time. Oh, I hate this podcast because it just makes me feel stupid, Brad. Okay, I've got more things to make you feel stupid. We'll move through them quite quickly. <laughs> okay. Um, 30, so we're 37 seconds into the video now. Uh, this is quite a simple one. We mentioned it at the beginning. Yes, you okay. gave up on the slipstream a bit too early. So rather than sitting in the slipstream of the car you're attacking for as long as possible and then popping out at the last minute whilst you've got the best possible momentum and the car in front doesn't know where you're going, you kind of pull out really early and then just get a face full of, of stationary air. Yeah. Um, so that, and, and that I'm, didn't and, help. And I'm giving away what I'm doing as well, I suppose. Yeah, exactly. And there's another similar comment a bit later on as well. Okay, so let, let's just talk slipstream in general, because I, there was a few occasions where the guys were weaving about ridiculously in that video all over the place. And I actually found that I gained on them. So can you, the guy's trying to break the toe in front of me. Can he, can he break the toe too much to the point that he disadvantages himself or herself? Yeah, so I actually didn't make a note on this, um, but I definitely remembered it. There was time. There were times where the car in front was doing this attempt at breaking the toe, and they were going so far, and you just stayed straight. I'm sure you actually gained time <laughs> yeah. on them because they were too far in front to really be giving you an effective toe anyway, and then they just drove further than they needed to. So if you were quite close to them within, I guess, say half a second or something like that, yeah. and they start doing this breaking the toe, it's probably a good idea to follow them because you'll still gain yeah. a, a good advantage by being in their slipstream all the time but if they're you know 50 meters down the track in front of you yeah. it's probably better just to take the shortest distance yeah I, I don't know do you do, do you engage in all that matt do you do you engage in the weaving the breaking the toe do you follow someone's gearbox i tell i just say crack on and i just don't bother if i'm following someone like that i, I want to get as close to the back of their car as i can before i pick a direction that's that's what I like to do. I don't like to tell them which side I want to go to. And I want to see like how they're trying to shade me as I approach them. Stuffy, I think I've been guilt I've been found guilty on this because it's true. I do tend to just declare too early what I'm gonna do, I think. Yeah, I I, I do try and follow as close as I can, um, and then use as much momentum as Brad says there. Um, but it's the weaving, I'm I'm not a big massive fan of it. I personally don't do it. If um, someone's in my slipstream, um, I, I'll try and move over and cover as quick as I can um, and break the toe sometimes. But I think there's a limit. And as, um, as you've highlighted there as well, sometimes it could be of a detriment. So I, I don't want to interrupt Brad's flow, but since you were foolish enough to send no, me No, no, it's, it, it's OK, because he's yelling at me and telling me I'm stupid. Break the flow all you want. I did have a very specific criticism for you, but only because I think no, it also go for it, go for it, me, go for it, yeah. Which is a lot of times as you were gaining on cars and especially going into corners, it felt like you, like compared to the, your rivals, they would bomb into corners with the nose in somebody else's gearbox. Whereas it looked like you would often actually back a little bit up and give extra space going into the corners and it feels like you're potentially giving away uh some some time there that might be of uh, use to you on the way out of the corner uh brad uh, uh, net code i'm uh, looking i'm looking at net code and i don't want to be like right in someone's gearbox because they could just thing is i've had this week i've had people just lifting and like deliberately kind of doing what we were talking about say into luffield linger on the apex so i wanted to leave a, bu a buffer in case that's what they're doing yeah, and all of these notes I've made are with the caveat that you survived the race and, and you enjoyed it. You got to the end and and you did probably better than you expected to do. So yeah. it, something you were doing was right. I just think you can you can now wind the caution in a little bit. And as your I rating progresses and you're racing against better, faster people, you can use less and less of this caution. So it's going to kind of go hand in hand. I think that also goes as well with um, confidence of the of the drivers in front of you. Um, after following them for a few laps, as you said, the F3 community is quite small. So there's a few, or large and small in, in essence, you've come across the same names yeah. and you know who you can go will to will with and who will be respectful and leave space. And if you don't know that person, following them for a couple of laps, just assessing where, what they do, what their breaking points are. And then you know, okay, I can get on their gearbox at this certain point and make a move here and feel more confident as the race goes on. Brad? 
So I, I've just got two more points, really, Go because on. a lot of these are, are repeating the same thing. So I'll give you a, a couple of different ones to end with. Um, at eight minutes, 24 in, so we're around about halfway through the video, um, you made a half attempt at a defense, uh, and I've written, but you should have squeezed the attacker at the turning point. You allowed him too much space, and he used it. So it was kind of like you had the opportunity to defend. You, you kind of still left enough of a gap anyway. And he just went straight through. So if you're going to do the defence, make sure there isn't actually room for them to, to come okay, through. Okay, set the scene. What corner was that? I haven't made a note, but I've got a vague memory that this is into Brooklyn. So it's 8 minutes 24 in, into the video. So anyone who is watching this back, see if my memory is good enough. That's right. I'm, I'm, playing sure. it. I'm playing it right now. And I think we're going, yeah, down the Wellington Strait. Oh, I see. Okay, so yeah, we're going around Brooklyn towards Luffield and... I've basically, I've given him the outside into Brooklyn's and just let him have the inside. I've just gifted him the inside into Luffield without squeezing him. So there's another one at 14 minutes and five seconds. It's quite a simple note by the looks of it here. You had the opportunity to defend the inside, but you made no attempt whatsoever. Okay, I'm watching that back. That sounds quite embarrassing. Oh, so this is into the, the maggots back its complex. No, it's not. No, I beg your pardon. I've got the chop of you. So this is the Wellington Strait again, and somebody's come on the inside of me going into Luffield, and that's uh, into, into Beckett's, and I've just completely given them the inside. So there, I needed to be moving across and just cutting down their options. I've given them a very wide line. It, that's what we talked about last week, wasn't it? Yeah, and there's a bit of a general theme here. Uh, if we're analysing your entire race, areas to improve, spatial awareness in terms of where the other cars are and how much space you're giving them. It's probably that simple. Be less kind to people, you know, cut a little bit closer to the inside yeah. if there's a car there while still just staying on the correct side of safe. So the car behind me, if you look at uh, at the 14 minute incident there, he, uh, he actually did what you guys have been talking about. He stayed in my slipstream for quite a long time, made a reasonably late decision to go inside. So in my mirrors, the second I see him moving to the inside, do I need to start following him a little? You should have already been on the inside, if um, I remember correctly. Right. I mean, I'm not so, watching it back no, now. No, no, you're so right, you're right, yeah. You didn't need to give him that option. So what probably would have been better is to encourage him to go the way you didn't want him to go. Sorry, encourage him to go the way you want him to go, but he doesn't want to go, which is typically the outside. Yeah. So you probably wanted to edge further to the inside. Then at the point where he pulls out to commit to the outside, use all the track up to where he's left you. So if he pulls all the way out to give himself a nice entry line, you go all the way out and match him just without actually going into him. Okay. All right, good. And did you say you had one more? That that was really the end. I mean, okay, there are cool. no, that's, yeah, no. Uh, pulling out of the slipstream too early is just another one. We spoke about it earlier. There's another one at um, eight minutes 45. So pulled out of the slipstream too early, letting the defender know where you were going. I believe that's into cops. Oh, it's, it's just it's just that it's just applying what we're doing, uh, what you've taught me smarter. So I hope that I can apply that going forward in future races. Uh, let us know what you think of the video. If you did a little bit of a watch along whilst we were talking about it, or if you think that was a dumb idea and we should never do that again, feel free to let us know. Spanners at mistapex.net. You can speak to Matt as well. Matt at mistapex.net too. Uh, the, the thing that I think I'm struggling with at the moment, Brad, in all honesty is everything we've talked about is one-on-one. -on -one. So when there's one car... I'm either attacking or defending. I can process a lot of what you're talking about. When it's five cars all together and every move also affects the car behind. So if you're attacking, it affects what the car behind is doing, etc. cetera. Um, or you're approaching multiple cars and their battle is slowing them down. And then you're in the... That's the kind of thing that's, that's now making me just panic and going to cold I have to sweat. say... Watching this video, there's a point where you catch a big pack of cars. Yeah, and yeah, I yeah. was watching it and the word danger was flashing in front of <laughs> yes, my eyes. Exactly. Because it looked it looked like something was gonna happen. So you did very well to make your way through that situation without some kind of contact. Brilliant. Let's go back to our change of series topic. Remind me, Scott, uh, what were you saying when I said um do you do anything other than F three? You were looking at LMP two. Yes, uh, yes, I predominantly race either F three and LMP two. Um, and iRacing, thankfully, have just announced a couple of new series. This is uh, it. That's LM what we wanted to talk about. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll start with the LMP2. Uh, they're announced uh, an LMP2 only series. Um, oh. Don't know how it's going to be, but yeah, a lot of, as uh, I think we've discussed on here before, a number of LMP2 is only available in multi class racing. 
Right. And they get a bit of a bad rep, us LMP2 drivers, for sending it on um, GTE. I've seen GTE. numerous uh, videos on YouTube that are like, LMP2 drivers are the devil, basically. Yes, so they've decided to separate us. <laughs> and um, <laughs> That's put really us all funny. Together. I've got so, an LMP2. I've got the 217 Dilara. So will it be all the LMP2s? That you yeah, there's only there's only the one, the Delara LMP uh, P217. Oh, is that the only one? Okay. Yeah, but um, I've had some real good races in that car, and s sometimes, as much as I love multi-class racing, you do wish they weren't there so that you could just carry on. And then Formula 3, the community has been shouting for ages for hourly races. Mm -hmm. um, yes. We've discussed it on here before, how frustrating it is that your race can end so quickly, um, as Matt has said. Um, his week has <laughs> ended up, yeah. but we are going to get fixed F3 series every well, every two hours. So we'll have it'll be alternating between um, a normal series where it'll be open setups, and then we'll have fixed setups. And what do you think that will will do to the community? Do you think everyone who's doing the open setups will jump into the the fixed? Yes. <sighs> when we did. When we did fixed setups with our Formula Renault 2.0, Brad, I remember people were getting very frustrated. Either the the rookies like me couldn't drive it and couldn't keep the back end, or people were like you were saying, this isn't a racy setup and it's boring and I hate it. Yes, but I actually am a massive advocate for fixed setups. Okay. Because I, I, we mentioned this before the show, actually. There's certain elements of racing in the real world where the driver doesn't have to do too much of it so yes. for example in formula one the driver is not working out where all the best places for ers deployment are there's a team of engineers which look at the data and then tell the driver and then the driver implements it in the best way and likewise the driver isn't making every single setup decision there are basic elements of setup which every driver knows you know i'd like a tweak of front wing if you're if you don't have enough front grip in a high speed corner but when you start getting into the real detail of suspension um you know the weight of your shock oil and spring rates and all this kind of thing <laughs> I'm engineers, not a engineers are largely driving this and the driver is giving feedback about how that affects the car when the change is made um uh, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So, so so the driver's not saying oh i need more spring arm on the right hand side they're saying i hit curb it go wibbly and then the engineer goes all oh, right yeah left damp flangey i'm i'm often stunned actually at the the basicness of some of the feedback i hear formula one drivers give on the radio where they go i've got no grip and i'm thinking Are you, <laughs> have you got no grip in the slow corners under acceleration or yeah. you know give a bit more of a specific to your engineer but yes in general i'm saying the driver isn't involved as much as as they are on iRacing in yeah. getting the setup tuned. And therefore I don't enjoy that element of it. And I don't want to spend all my time <laughs> fiddling with a setup, knowing that someone else who's better at this than me has definitely got a better one. I'd much rather just start the race, deal with the understeer that this baseline setup has. And I know that everyone's on the same and I just have to change the driving. Well, fascinating little tidbit uh, about Formula One and setup is that Number one, what you said is exactly why people like Robert Kubica and Romain Grosjean, who finally has left the series, were around so long is because they were capable of giving exactly that kind of feedback to their engineers, very detailed and accurate about car behavior. And secondly, Mercedes has barely added anything to its car this year. Almost everything that you see is an improvement to how their car has been is primarily probably due mostly to setup. Yep. And I've, as Brad was saying, some of my most exciting races, I race in a fixed TCR series with some friends and I've had some great battles because it just comes down to driver ability rather than certain setup yeah. tricks or knowing more information in the setup. As much as I'd love to learn more about that, a lot of us don't. So I think the fixed series is going to be very popular and people just love F3 in general. They'll, they'll race it no matter what. Uh, and just just as kind of a, a a topper to this setup discussion, I've seen with my own eyes some of the top teams when I've had the privilege of racing in a in a front running team in in the DNLS series, for example, um, in the GT3s, 
And I saw the amount of work. They had people almost permanently driving around the Nordschleifer, changing tiny things <laughs> and just looking at data with systems I've never seen, certainly yeah. not like standard available iRacing um, setup pages, and just measuring ride heights at certain speeds and making all sorts of graphs to work out what the very best compromise was. And I just can't be bothered to do that. And I wouldn't yeah. know how either. And Stuffy, as, as much as people say, oh, the setups, a lot of it is just down to preference. I think there will definitely be times that you get to a track and someone's just got the killer setup, which is, you know, maybe even up to half a second faster and you're just not going to do anything. Because I've been in that situation where someone's given me, um, there was a negative rake setup, I think, for Spa. And I had such a dilemma because I didn't want to share it with everyone because I tried it and it was amazing. And I ended up sharing it with everybody in the map championship. But yeah, it's a thing. Yeah, you didn't share that with me. I didn't know you before, uh, no, what uh, around did, that time. Which what is I did a shame. was in the, in our Discord, I share <laughs> all the setups, um, and we we tend to do uh, a slow one where the back end will never go. We do a fast one that we think is competitive, and then what I do is I go on VRS. So everyone has to go on the VRS telemetry, and I pick the fastest drivers, and I just share all of all of theirs under like an anonymous name and there yeah everyone started sharing one from a certain driver and it was like oh we've all found half a second <laughs> yeah and that's exactly the the track that i was going to mention i think it was a couple of seasons ago people were managing to gain eight kilometers an hour or 10 kilometers an hour down um down the main or the long track i can't remember what, what the straight's called now um, um after o rouge uh, but the, down there that's it the camel straight um, and it was, but not losing uh, any downforce around the rest of the track. Um, I tried to plan around with it and I would just end up crashing. But like Brad said, most of us haven't got the time to put <laughs> that much effort into yeah. a setup. It's why we just buy the, the basic ones where guys do spend a little bit more time. But even then, they're not the ones that they specifically use. So I think the set, fixed setup is proven to be very, um, very well received uh, with the VRS Sprint. They've um, trialled it there first and people just race GT3s all night and I think it'll be exactly the same. So yeah, looking forward to it. Yeah, looking forward to to a little bit of a level, play, level playing field. It will be interesting to see if some of the aliens where you go, where's that pace come from? If they avoid the fixed series or whether they do it and then come back into the pack a little bit, that'll be interesting. Uh, Brad, you are... Oh, sorry, before we get away from that... Um, there used to be no iRacing specific setups in the open setups. So that's something they've recently started doing. And they started off not being good. But the last few F3 tracks, the iRacing setups have been very good and not like overly safe and understeery. So I'm quite optimistic that that I think, you know, the fixed setups might be fairly drivable and fun as well. Just one last point on mm -hmm. that. One tip I will tell people is... The fixed setups, yes, you're right, they have um, improved dramatically. But the brake bias, just a little tip for anyone out there, just check it because uh. it can be so far back um, that it's actually a detriment to you. We, we kind of want it a little bit more forward. So if you're struggling with the fixed setups, um, yeah, a little uh, tidbit for everyone out there. Excellent. So they tend to be too far back, so we need to... So what, you're getting like rear locking? Yes, yeah. Oh, okay. Yes, I think I noticed that at Phillip Island. No, not Phillip Island. I'll remember it in a second. Uh, one of the Zeds. Not, Zolder. Zolder, yes. At Zolder, uh, the, the, the brake bias was, and I couldn't get it stopped into the hairpin. Brad, you're looking at, um, you've moved series, in fact. You were trying, this is what I don't like about people who get to spend a lot of time doing iRacing, is that you get bored of series much faster than more, mere mortals. So from persuading us to go to F1, you've already moved on. So I didn't really get bored of the F1. I'll, I'll try and explain. Basically, <laughs> there was a, a guy, a real nice guy that I started chatting to on Discord, who uh, showed me some, some tricks with the ERS system in the Formula One car. And he effectively... He showed me that you would gain more time by deliberately backing off the throttle at certain places, still deploying a little bit of ERS, but you're actually gaining, you're actually charging the battery if you're not deploying too much on the straights because you're okay. using the exhaust gases to charge the battery. Oh, who cares? Over, 
over a whole lap, you would actually gain more time. And it and and he showed me his data, and it's, it's all completely correct. Yeah. He also explained that if you let the engine rev really high in the low gears, but then short shifted at the blue light in the higher gears, that was kind of the best compromise. And I'll be honest, it completely <laughs> turned me off the Formula One because it made yeah. me think there is no way I care enough to spend the time practicing this because it's actually quite hard to lift mm. off the throttle the right amount without staring at the steering wheel at the little ERS deployment figure. Um, I just couldn't be bothered to do that. It sapped the fun. It made me think, oh, <laughs> the very quickest people are doing this all the time. I'm never going to be that person. I was going to go to you, Matt, because that sounds like something you'd love to do. <laughs> it sounds exactly like Mario Andretti saying goodbye to Formula One because it's all pushing buttons now, which is exactly what he did when he boogadied off to IndyCar after winning the, the world championship. He said, it's just not fun when you're having to, when it's all knob twiddling and button pushing. So coupled with that, I also kind of got a little bit tired of the, the constant tire saving and how fragile the tires were. It's, it's interesting as a strategic element. And if that was the only thing, if yeah. there was no ERS deployment and all that kind of thing, if it was just soft tires that go off, that's kind of fine because I can deal with a bit of time. I have to say, but- a few weeks back when you were talking about tire saving and, and saying how brilliant that was and how fun that was, the whole time I was thinking, shut up, Brad. That sounds absolute turd. So ignore Brad from two to three weeks ago <laughs> okay. and listen to listen to current listen to Brad. current Brad. Um, I think there's a series which might be the right compromise for you if you're looking to kind of move up a little bit, and for me where I'm looking for something just a bit more kind of pure. And my friends persuaded me to try the Formula 3.5, which is formerly the Formula Renault 3.5, but I believe iRacing must have finished their deal with, with, with Renault. Renault. <laughs> they've removed the word Renault from the steering wheel. So it's and just it's also- Formula 3.5. Okay. Formula 3.5. And basically, it's a normally aspirated car. Um, there's no electronics to worry about. Um, and it's got very linear power delivery. It's obviously slower than a Formula One car. It's roughly Formula Two levels of performance or Formula Two from a few years ago. Right. So, so it is a step up. Definitely a step up from the Formula Three. Uh, you have to use a little bit more throttle control than you do in the Formula Three. So you can spin the wheels, but it's not with a load of torque coming in at once with a like with a hybrid system or a turbocharged engine. It's very linear. And there's a lot of mechanical grip. And the tyres last the whole race. So your fastest laps are generally the last couple of laps. Yeah. Um, because so the tyres don't drop off. If you have a spin, you don't suddenly destroy the tyres. Um, so that's good. And the racing seems to be really close because there's quite a lot of drag. So the slipstream has a big effect. So I've been doing a few races in that. Yeah. It's been really good fun. And it's Monza this week. And I'm having lots of slipstream battles. Nice. Okay. So, so Scott, have you done that? Have you done 3.5? Have you tried it? Yes, I have. Yeah, I haven't uh, done too many races in it, but yeah, I I thoroughly enjoyed it as well. It's unfortunately I haven't quite had the time to jump back into it, but the fat Brad just said it's at Monza. Yeah, it's, uh, has tickled my fancy a little bit. I will have to uh, I, see you out on track, Brad. I've skipped every series when it's got to Monza because I hate Ferrari because they're the Death Star, so I don't want to buy their home track, but. Honestly, I've avoided it, and my son wanted to do because my son loves the ovals, and he wanted to do the the DW12 IndyCar, and it's at Monza Oval this week. And I'm like, no, you can't do it because I don't own that track, and I'm not buying it. Come to the dark side. No, Brad. <laughs> The races are also quite well populated. So unlike the F1 series where you had to really wait till the end of the week, Friday, Saturday nights were when you got races which went official. Every race I've entered uh, all through the oh, day okay. in, in 3.5 seems to have enough participation, um, you know, kind of 15 to 20 cars and then several splits when you get into the evening. So okay. it's quite good. So so we'll go away from this. We'll all recommend a, a series to jump into and to have a go at. So Brad's recommending uh, Formula 3.5 to go and jump in and, and have a look at. What license is that? B license. B license. I have that. Excellent. I can do that. Um Someone's been trying to get me to do the uh, something something 2000, Indy 2000, ISF 2000. Is that what it is? Indy Pro. Indy Pro. Right. Would you guys recommend that? So that, that's essentially a Formula 4 car. That's right. what that's what it would be in Europe. Um, and yeah, it's, it's quite good. I think the tyre model is really good in that, but quite quite difficult. And that's I think it's a overall license for that one. Mixed. Oh, is it mixed, is it? Yeah. All right. Okay, fair enough. Uh, you're, you would direct us to what, Scott? If, to, if I was going to try a non-F3 series? 
Um, it would have to be an LMP2, maybe IMSA, because you get a good mixture of multi-class racing. Yes, and I think um, IMSA is a good track to, uh, this week, but I can't remember which one it is. Oh, I can't remember off the top of my head either. It's a B licence. Yeah, I um, saw it earlier and there. I remember thinking, oh, that's a good track. So check out IMSA. Matt, you do the majors. What's that? Uh, the majors is, uh, it's a league, but it's a fairly well populated league where you race entirely different cars, sometimes on highly inappropriate tracks. <laughs> and they have three different races. They have um, an American race, they have a European race, and they have an international race, which is basically uh, the Australian races. So the last thing we did was the Indy 500. Before that, we did a multi-class race at the Nordschleife, where I actually did very well in the uh, McLaren. Thank you very uh, much. Yeah. Four. <laughs> yeah, no, remarkably well. I actually was on pole, believe it or not, which... I actually didn't know till after I'd finished the race, gone to bed and woken up and, and caught up on Slack. <laughs> People followed the race. Um, uh, but it's, it's well populated. It's competitive. And, um, and, and I, I enjoy having to learn how to drive the different things between the ovals and the road courses and having to acquire and master new cars. It's, it's a fun challenge. Sounds good. Follow Matt at MattPT55. Follow Brad on YouTube by searching for Brad Philpot. He's got Brad on his hat. That's how you know That's how you know what his name is. And um, also follow him at Bradley Philpot on Twitter. If you look on his YouTube channel, you can watch a live build replay of him building that spectacular uh, single-seater Formula One style sim rig. Um, still enjoying it, Brad? All good? Oh, it's amazing. <laughs> the, um, the Sim Lab rig is just the best thing ever. I love it. And most importantly, follow our new friend Stuffy on his channel. You've got lap guides, you've got uh, post race previews of your races in F3. What do we search for? Stuffy? Stuffy, S O S T U double F E double Y. Yeah, snappy. We'll definitely remember yeah. that. Links to everything in the show notes below. Guys, thank you very much for joining us on Mist Apex iRacing podcast. Until we see you next, work hard, be kind, have fun, defend the inside line, don't unnecessarily give room, don't volunteer to exit the slipstream, stay behind the car in front until the last possible minute so that you don't advertise where you're going to go. Panic when you get into a pack of five. I think I've absorbed everything, Brad. I think I'm ready. Yeah, go race now. Go. I'm going to go race now, definitely, if my wife lets me. Bye, guys. Thank you very much. <laughs>